Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. He chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adapt us into his own family. Al acercarnos a sí mismo a través de Jesucristo. This is what he wanted to do. This is what he wanted to do. This is what he wanted to do. We are adopted. Somos adoptados. We are rescued. Somos escogidos. We are chosen. We are chosen. We are chosen. We are chosen. Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Northridge Church. I want to welcome everybody, whether you're joining us from Henrietta, Webster, Aranacoit, or Greece, or you're driving in your car, you're at home engaging with us online, or you're a guest checking us out for the first or second time. To everybody, welcome to Northridge Church. We're honored to have you here this morning. And, you know, it's been a little bit of an interesting week. Uh, we, we got some snow. Seems a little early for snow. But, you know, I mean, we'll just, we'll take it. And, you know, I I have received a little bit of of, of responsibility for that snow because, you know, I've gotten some messages on Facebook that say, you know, if you prematurely decorate for Christmas that the weather comes to. (laughs) And I may or may not have three Christmas trees up in my house currently. I can't deny or approve that at all. And so I just want everybody to know I'm not skipping Thanksgiving. I am so thankful that Christmas is coming. I just needed to get that off my chest. (laughs) Welcome to Northridge Church. Excited to have you. And this morning, we're finishing up a series that we've been in for the last three weeks where we've just been walking through the the story and the theology of the gospel through a unique lens that the New Testament gives us called adoption. And we started this journey with the theme of rejection, that we are all born because of our sin, rejecting God in a hopeless situation, but God paid for our sin. He, he dealt with the ramifications that our sin brought ultimately to redeem us. And Jesus was ratified through the resurrection that he was who he exactly said he was and that his payment was sufficient for us. And we've walked up to this point. Jesus is dead. He's rose, he's rose again. And, and, and some of you might be wondering, why in the world are we still in this series? I mean, doesn't the gospel end with the resurrection? I mean, isn't that the solidification, the verification of the story of the gospel? Jesus is alive. The gospel is over. And I want us to understand that the gospel doesn't end with the resurrection. The gospel doesn't end with the resurrection. Maybe the story of Jesus does. Maybe what Jesus came to accomplish does, but The implications for you and I, the benefits of the gospel continue far after the resurrection. And in this series, we kind of sum it up in in, in what Ephesians says, Ephesians 1 verse 5. It's been the video you've watched before I've come out each week. It says this, this is the verse, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. That's what this series has been about, the gospel, God adopting us into his family through his son's work. And it says, this is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. And that last line just blows my mind, that it brought God pleasure to adopt us. That this wasn't something God was hesitant about. Like, ah, should I save them from their sin? Uh, It wasn't something God God questioned or thought about. This was something that he enjoyed, something that brought him great pleasure to bring you and I into the family of God. And as we wind down this series on the gospel through that lens of adoption, we have to understand that the gospel is, is our story of how we can become a part of family, the family of God. When we believe in the gospel, when we surrender to it, we are, being, we are choosing to be adopted into the family of God. You and I, I become a son of God. You become a daughter of God. And that's the, our adoption story. And we have to realize that when we become a part of God's family, it comes with some really awesome benefits. It comes with some implications for our lives in the future. And not only in the future, but our current reality today. It's much like this. You think of benefits. We often think of a position or a job. 
Many of you, you have jobs right now. Currently, some of you are in pursuit of a job. And, and you think about that, that idea, that concept of, of trying to find a job. All the legwork is really up front. You know, you're crafting and creating a resume and you're trying to make it look good so it sticks out to companies and businesses. And so you send that resume out to multiple businesses and corporations and, and hoping that you would get an interview. And so as the process continues, you find yourself sitting in office after office, talking to somebody, answering all these questions about yourself and your work habits and your strengths and your weaknesses. And the list goes on and on and you're working through this process. But in this process to find a job, it, it begins to turn. Because when that company decides they want you to be a part of their company, it, it turns from you selling yourself to thou, them selling you. Because they go to offer you a job and what they do is they send you this list or they walk through this verbally, this list of benefits that you will obtain, that you will get if you choose to work for their company. And that's a lot like the gospel a little bit is, hey, when we become a part of the family of God, when we believe in the gospel and we choose to submit to the gospel, it comes with a benefit package. There's two types of benefits. I've broken them down for you. There's future benefits, and then there's current benefits. And so let's start with the future ones. The first one starts here. This is some of the benefits of being part of the, the, the family of God. We're no longer slaves, but we're heirs. We're no longer slaves. You see, the Bible says we are slaves to sin. We find ourselves in bondage because we've rejected God. And, and God pulls us out of slavery and he makes us heirs. Heirs to the kingdom of God. This is what Galatians says. It says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now, now, for a moment, let, let that sink in for a second. What God did for you. God took you from slavery. Slavery is the worst position anybody can find themselves in. Because at, at slavery, you're in bondage. There's no hope. There's just work and grind. Your goal is to do what everybody else tells you to do. And that's where we were. We were slaves to our sin, held in bondage, and yet God saw us and he pulled us out of slavery, the worst possible position ever, and he took us not to like some medium position of like, okay, our life's good now. No, God took us from slavery and he pulled us all the way to becoming heirs into the kingdom of God. That's a pretty significant leap, don't you think? Slavery to now I'm, I'm going to receive an inheritance as an heir of the kingdom of God? I mean, that's a ridiculous benefit. And let's dig a little bit deeper into what it means to be an heir of, of, of God's kingdom. Be, because, man, an heir receives an inheritance, we know that. But not only are we heirs, but we are co-heirs with Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. What exactly does that mean? What, what that means is, Whatever Christ, Jesus Christ gets, you know, our Savior, whatever he gets as an inheritance, we get the same thing. This is what the Bible says, Romans chapter 8. It says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that may, we may also share in his glory. And so we become heirs, and not just heirs, but we are co-heirs. It means whatever Christ, we are written equally into the benefit package at the same level of Jesus Christ. And for some of you, that might be like, well, that just doesn't seem fair to Jesus. I mean, he's the one who, who paid for our sin. He did all the work, and yet we get to receive the same inheritance that Jesus does? Like, wow, that's, that's pretty mind-blowing, but you have to understand. Jesus is, is the son of God. And when you believe in the gospel, you become a son or a daughter of God. And therefore, you get the same benefit package. You become a co-heir with the son of God. Pretty amazing. Whatever Jesus gets as an inheritance, you and I as being adopted into the family of God, we get. God gives us access to an inheritance that will never fade. God gives us, we're longing for this inheritance. And what's amazing about this inheritance is you can't overspend it. You can't blow it. It's an inheritance that will never fade away. And when I, when I think about this term, the inheritance, my mind always jumps to Luke chapter 15. 
You, you might have heard this story before. If you have, I'd encourage you to read it because it's really the opposite of the inheritance that we'll receive. Luke chapter 15 is the story of the prodigal son. And in the prodigal son, he, he, this son asks his father for his inheritance. And so he gives it to him. He gives him all this cattle, this money. He receives what he was due. And he goes and he, he blows it. He squanders it in what the Bible calls wild living. And, and, and the reality is, is the inheritance that we are waiting for from Jesus Christ is an inheritance that we can't overspend. It's an inheritance that will never spoil or fade. In fact, this is what Peter says. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And look at this. It says, in, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. How, what a blessing that we have a future inheritance that will never perish or never spoil or fade. And then finally, the last thing we have, a last benefit is we have an eternal home. We have an eternal home. And I think for children of God, Christians today, this, this, this blessing, this benefit should really remind us of, of something. Because I think for many Christians, we've gotten a little bit too comfortable in, in this world. And, and the reality is, is this world was never designed to be your home. But some of us as Christians, we've gotten a little bit too cozy here on earth when God is reminding us through this benefit that, hey, you probably shouldn't get too cozy here because this isn't your home. Hebrews 13, it says this, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And so as Christians, that, that should lead us to live a little bit differently here on this earth, not to hold so tightly to the things that we, we love here, but long for that day where we get to go home with our heavenly father. I mean, this is a place we really, the, the verse previously says we share in Christ's suffering and that suffering is here on earth. You see, our goal is not to get comfortable here. It's honestly to prep people and to lead people to come with us to that eternal home. But yet, some of us, we've, we've gotten a little bit too cozy here. And I don't know about you, but when you think about that term home, I mean, we got signs all in Kirkland's and everywhere, like home is where your heart is, or home is where your husband is, or home is that and that. You know. <laughs> home is a big deal to us, though. I mean, I remember when I was in college, I couldn't wait to go home because home meant mama's cooking, you know? But there's something true about our homes. Like for me, I won't do certain things at other pe people's houses that I, I would do at my home. Because there's only a certain level of comfort that you can achieve somewhere else other than your home. I mean, for example, I would never go to somebody's house and, and just kind of open their fridge and be like, oh, wow, what you got in here? Like, that's just not something I would do. Honestly, my parents would, would probably beat me if I did that in other people's houses. But another thing I would never do is I'd never go into, like, the master bedroom or bathroom of somebody's home. That's just kind of weird and awkward. Like, hi, it was beautiful. <laughs> like, what are you doing in our bedroom? <laughs> if you've ever been in my master bedroom, that's what I'm thinking when you're there. And there's just certain things, there's this level of comfort, comfortability that you have at, at your home that you can't achieve anywhere else. And honestly, I think as Christians, we've forgotten that because we've gotten so comfortable here that we forget about all the comforts that are waiting for us in our actual home. And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 14 about this. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. And man, if, if you would just stop here and say, wow, that's quite a benefit package for being in the family of God. I'm, I, I'm go I've gone from slavery to becoming an heir with an inheritance and now I have a home that I long for and wait for. And, and it brings up this tension a little bit is for some of you, you might have this angst in your heart. Well, how do I know that I'm waiting for that inheritance. How do I know that, that God, I'm part of God's family? And how do I know that I, I'm longing and waiting for that inheritance? And what I love about the strategicness of God is he actually gave us a deposit to the future inheritance. Ephesians chapter one, it says this. It says, and you were also, and, and you were also included 
in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's what we've been walking through for these four weeks. The message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. It says when you believe, when you choose to believe, you are marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, get this, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance unto the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory name, of his glory. You see, what happens here is for some of us who have that angst is the Holy Spirit is the down payment for our inheritance. You see, God, when you choose to believe, what that verse is saying is when you understand the truth, the truth will set you free. And the truth of the gospel is that you've been adopted into God's family. And when that happens, in the moment, God sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And that is the deposit that, that can assure you of that inheritance that you can long for. Because the Holy Spirit is that down payment. But the reality is, is God doesn't just change your future. Those are things that we get to look forward to as being part of the family of God. Those are things that we long for and can't wait for. But the gospel just doesn't change your future. It changes your reality right now. And I want to walk through three benefits that are current for every Christian that are there for your taking right now, today. And the first one is peace. Peace. I mean, doesn't that sound great? Like peace in the, in the midst of a chaotic and, and crazy world? Peace in the midst of a, of a storm that you can't see that's coming. Peace in the midst of when life turns upside down. You see, God promises his children peace. And it's a peace that your mind won't grasp. It's a peace that you won't fathom. It's a peace that those around you won't understand. In fact, Philippians says this. It says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so this first part, is it's kind of setting up that piece. It's saying, hey, as a child of God, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to be anxious about how you're going to pay your bills. You don't have to be anxious about the storm you're walking through. You don't have to be anxious about that diagnosis. You don't have to, be, you don't have to worry about your children. Why? God answers. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, one of the benefits of being a child of God is he gives you peace. And it's a peace that when you walk through cancer, you won't be shaken. It's a peace that when you lose somebody you love and it surprises you, it's a peace that, that, that won't allow you to be shaken. It's a peace that walks through the hardest times in life and, and you're not shaken because your trust was never in those things. It was in your Savior. But yet, man... This is a, a benefit today that God offers you, but I wonder how many Christians actually live in peace. You know, when life gets really difficult, do we have peace as Christians? Because it's there for us, but do we step into the benefit? Or are we as shaken as everybody else in our culture when bad things happen? The second benefit today is, is a guide. A guide. Someone to walk with you through life, to teach you, to mold you, to break you to give you understanding. This guide is the Holy Spirit, that down payment or deposit of your inheritance. Jesus talks about him in John. He says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And get this, he, he reminds us of the first benefit that comes actually from our guide. It says, peace I will leave with you. My peace I will give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. So right here in, in the second benefit, God reminds us of the first benefit and where the first benefit comes from. It says it comes from your guide. That's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He guides you throughout life. If you're a child of God, in that moment where you believed, God sent the Holy Spirit to walk with you every single day of your life. That's why the Bible says, hey, he'll never leave you nor forsake you because guess what? He lives inside of you. And so everywhere you go, God goes with you. Live in that confidence. And for a second, just, let's just think about this for a second. Okay, last week we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. Someone who was dead and then came back to life. That, that's an odd thing because we don't see that every single day or month or year or a long time. Like we, we don't get to see that. That's amazing. But this is what the Bible says. The, the person responsible for raising Jesus from the dead was the Holy Spirit. 
And the Bible says that Holy Spirit with that power, guess where it lives and resides? In you and me. Holy smokes. What a gift. And the fact that, that God lives inside of me and walks with me every single day and he guides me. I mean, I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit's work in my life that there are times when I'm getting ready to do something stupid and he whispers in my ear, Drew, don't do that. You ever been there? You know those times where the Holy Spirit says, hey, that person is hurting. Open your eyes and talk to them. Encourage them. You know, those times where the Holy Spirit says, hey, don't go there because there's trouble. He gives you that sense of like, hey, there's, there's something going on here. And that's a gift from God because you are part of his family, a guide to walk through in life. But then thirdly, direct access. That we have direct access to God himself. And man, I, I, I don't know about you, but when I was studying and when I was prepping for this message six, six to 12 weeks out from today, I was just, I was just really convicted in, in my own personal walk with God. Because when you see this on paper, that God gives you peace, that God gives you a guide and he gives you direct access to him, when you, when you see it on paper, it, it just really convicted me because how many times do I just take this for granted? Do I just overlook this? The fact that, man, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and that I, I can go to God at any moment in my life when life is really difficult. I don't have to wait on God. I don't have to get in line for God. I can just talk to him. I have direct access to him. And I don't know about you, but so many times in my life, prayer has, is more of a problem and a pain than it is a privilege. And I, I just felt so guilty. And, and honestly, I had to stop and say, God, I'm sorry for neglecting and overlooking the benefits that you've given me today that I can live in and walk in. Because look what Ephesians says. It says, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God. Let me, let me just read that again. We may approach God with Freedom and confidence. Man, wow. We have access to the creator of the universe who, who created you and knows you better, knows what you need before you need it, who sees the storm that you're walking through way before you ever encounter it. You have access to him. What a gift. And yet I think oftentimes we, we just overlook it. We don't step into it. And maybe I'm a little bit more convicted about this because I've seen over the last three months in my life how the gospel changes people. Because I've seen it in my son Malachi. Because, you see, the gospel has been working on my life and in my wife's lives over the course of our marriage and the course of our lives. You see, the reason why we adopted is not because we're good people. It's because God's gospel is working in our lives and over the course of five years, we pursued this boy. You, you don't realize this. Maybe many of you don't know our story, but we named him Judah like five years before he, we got his name Malachi. We prayed for Judah way before we prayed for Malachi. And, and in this journey, we pursued this boy. And then we got to fly to China and we got to see him and meet him. And I just wish that I could somehow give you a glimpse of what these eyes have seen. And I know we've, we've given you some picture of it because we've shown you some videos, but man, I wish you could have walked into his orphanage. And I wish you could have smelled what we smelled. And I wish you could have seen those babies lying in those cribs. Because here was this boy, he was an orphan. You know what he did for 20 hours of his life every single day is he laid in a crib. No, I'm sorry, he laid in a cage. A, 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 a cardboard box or a piece of wood to lay on, barely any blankets, and he stank. He smelled. And that was his life. That's what he had to look forward to every day. Hey, maybe the metal will speak back to me today. That was his future. And I wish you could have seen that place. It smelled like death. But we got there. And we loved him. 
and we showed him love through the gospel living in us. We loved him. And over the course of three months, God took an orphan with no future and he changed his life completely. He used to have a facial deformity. It's gone. It's no longer there. And God took an orphan without a future and he made him an heir in my family. Check this out. mother's body. When I was put together there, you saw my body as it was formed. I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. I tend to have thoughts that bounce all over the room, so when I do my quiet time, I keep a prayer journal. Otherwise, my brain tries to jump to the laundry or something. So I have kept a prayer journal for years, um, and it's been very helpful for me to just write out what I see and what I think and what I feel and, and to just bounce in with scripture. I just wanted to read a couple of excerpts from my prayer journal surrounding the time of our adoption. This entry is from November 17th, 2013. God, I want your plan, not mine. You know the end of my story. I guess I thought I'd have kids by now. I guess I thought I'd be mature by now. Teach me what you need to teach me, Lord. God, you are amazing. You watch every child as they are formed. You are there. Your love, it's stronger than life. God, I trouble today, I worry. Lord, we pray, please be with our son. Touch his body. You are the only one in that country who knows him. You are his only hope. So Lord, I pray, please touch him in his crib. Keep him safe. Lord. I pray that Drew and I can get to our son in your timing, in your will. God, I pray more than anything else that he chooses you when the time comes. Lord, I pray that our son is a man after your heart. I never thought about it at the time, but I'm so glad I was able to write some of this down because now it feels surreal. Five years later, Malachi is asleep in his room right now. And I can look back and see all the things I prayed for. That's invaluable. You know, sometimes we have all these gifts and we forget how much we prayed for what we're currently complaining about or a really tough situation or just a really bad day of toddler life. I feel super grateful that I can go back and see that everything was a gift and despite a really hard time or whatever lies ahead, we know without a shadow of a doubt that God took us through this. God carried us every step of the way. And my prayers were heard and our son has a future in that. be the first to say that we are not Malachi's savior. That's Jesus's role to play. But God has called us to play a role in his life. And being part of our family comes with benefits. 
comes with food to eat every single morning at breakfast and lunch and dinner. It comes with a, a bed to sleep in at night. Not a cardboard box or not a sheet of plywood, but a mattress with covers and blankets. It comes with a family to love him. It comes with sisters, wild and crazy spicy sisters who are gonna dance with him, kiss him, hug him, wrestle him, sometimes steal his toys. It comes with a home to live in, a place to be loved, a place to be cared for, a mom and dad to call mommy and daddy, a future, a future of a promise that we're gonna lead him and guide him to God's word and to who God is. And ultimately the best thing, the best benefit is that we're gonna lead him to his savior because we recognize that we aren't his savior. And so it comes with a home that is gonna preach and lead him to Jesus. You know, it's been amazing to see day after day this kid grow and watch him change. And, and his story ultimately is, is a flawed and, and a small picture of what God did for us. I mean, his change is minimal to what God offers every single one of us to be adopted into his family. And when we think about that, when we think that God went through all of this so that we could be part of his family, there's a couple things that we have to know. You know, maybe you're here this morning and, and, and you have chosen not to believe in the gospel. Maybe you're still on the fence. You're, you're still deciding, I, I, I know the story, but I'm just not there yet. And I want you to understand that everything I've talked about, every benefit to being a part of the family of God, all of it can be yours. All of it can be yours. It's just solely based on, on one simple but yet profound decision to place your faith and trust, not in yourselves, not in your ability, not in your might, but to put your faith and trust into who Jesus is and what he accomplished for you. That he died for your sins, that you were rejecting God and that he died for you and he rose again and he's given you victory. He's taken you from slavery and he's given you an opportunity to be a part of his family. And every benefit that I've laid out for you can be yours, but you just have to believe. Believe in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on your behalf. And man, what, what would keep you from that? But that is a choice that you have to make. A choice that you have to decide on. I can't do it for you because if I could, I would have already. But I can't. And then secondly, as believers, as, as Christ followers, as people, as children, as children of God being adopted into the family of God, you know, the amazing thing about the family of God is, is, is you look at Northridge Church. We'll just use Northridge Church as an example because it's filled of, of people who are family of, uh, in the family of God. And what's amazing about the family of God is, is we're different. We look different, we act different, we think differently, and we may be different, but we have to be reminded that we are family. We're different, but we're family. And that's the great thing about God's family. 
That's the great thing about the gospel is the gospel is the only thing that can do that because at the cross of Jesus Christ, it makes us all equal. It makes us all equal because at the end of the day, the gospel doesn't care whether you're black or white. The gospel doesn't care whether you're rich or poor. The gospel doesn't care about your cultural background. The gospel doesn't care about your class or your popularity because we all approach the gospel in the exact same way as sinners in need of a savior. And we have to be reminded that, yeah, we might look different. Yeah, we might act differently. Heck, we might even vote differently. But at the end of the day, we are family. And in a culture that, wants, that seems like it wants to divide us, the great thing about the gospel is it doesn't divide us. It actually brings us together at the foot of the cross where we are all united together and where we can stand together. And how grateful. I'm sorry, but you're part of my family. Yeah, doesn't get better, I'm sorry. <laughs> and here's what I would tell you today. If, if you are part of the family of God, I would challenge you to do two things. When you think about the gospel, we've walked through the gospel for four weeks, and here's, what I would, here's how I would tell you to allow the gospel to change the way you live. The first thing I would tell you to do is to live like a royal. To live like a royal. God took you out of slavery, not so you could act like a slave still. God took you out of slavery and out of bondage and he made you an heir into his kingdom and he's made you a royal. And so we have to live like that and there's two implications of that. The first one is, hey, we can revel in our royalty. We can be confident in what God has promised us and the the benefits that he's, he's leading us to and we can step into them, we can puff out our chest and be confident in not what we have done but what Jesus has done for us. And so revel and rejoice and be thankful for what God has done for you and where he's taken you from and led you to. But the second thing about royalty that even is true about our culture today is anyone who is in a royal family, they live according to a different standard. And as we live like royals, as we live like children of Jesus Christ, children of God, we understand that God has called us to a different standard. And that standard is found in his holy word, the the, the Bible. And so we have to live according to the standards God has set before us. As royals, we're called to live differently. We should stand out in this world. And so live like a royal. Rejoice and revel in your royalty and live according to the standard that God has given you. And then finally, I would just tell you every single day to remember who your father is. Remember who your dad is. Because when you think about adoption, God gives you, he he adopts you into his family and so he is your heavenly father. Romans 8 speaks about this. It says, for those of you who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. You, You can leave that behind, the slavery and the fear behind. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba. And Abba means father or daddy. And I think as as Christians, we have to remind ourselves every single day of who our father truly is. That God, we have a a father who's all powerful and all knowing. And man, I, I have had the privilege in my life to have an amazing father. I I know many of us who who live today weren't blessed like that, but I was. And there's one thing I, I knew about my father above everything else, is he always had my back. It didn't matter how big of a mess I created or how stupid I was as a teenager. I knew my dad would always bail me out. He would always have my back. He punished me later, but he would always be there for me. And and that changed the way I lived from a little boy all the way up to an adult today, is knowing, hey, my dad has got my back. And that's the truth for every single one of you. Maybe you're here today and you didn't have a father figure like that. Well, let me tell you something. God offers that to you today. He offers you a father figure who will always be there for you, who will never leave you or forsake you, but he'll walk with you and he'll guide you just like a father should. 
And there's going to be times in your life as a child of God where the enemy reminds you of your past, where the enemy reminds you that you're not, you feel like you're not worth anything. And you know what you got to tell the enemy sometimes? Hey, do you want to know something? Do you know who my daddy is? Do you know who my father is? Because my father redeemed me and he pulled me out of slavery and he pulled me out of bondage and he says I'm worth something and he says I'm rescued and I'm redeemed and because of who my daddy is, I don't have to listen to you anymore because I have confidence because of who my father is. And I'm telling you today, we have to live like that, that the God of the universe, we are a part of his family. And ultimately, that's the gospel, that God took us as sinners without hope, and he gave us hope. We were lost, but he found us. And then as we wind down this series and we, we look at the gospel, our, our band's going to sing a song. And, and I love this song because it really shows you through words of where God has found us and where he leads us that God took you and me as orphans and he gave us a home and he made us heirs. And so as our band sings this song, I would encourage you just to sit in your seats at all of our campuses. If you're watching online, just grab a seat and just to take in these words and see that God took an orphan and he made him an heir. Listen to the words of this song. To accept it from forgotten to remember from the victor to the victor who we are is not the same and it changes night and day no longer orphans now sons and daughters worthy and wanted we
I want to introduce you to the newest member of the Karshner family. This is Malachi. Can you say hi? <laughs> and you know, I, I, I brought him here this morning so you could see with your own eyes the power of the gospel because it's turned this little boy's life upside down. And the reality is, is for his life is really our prayers are just beginning because at the end of the day, my goal is not to make his life better here on earth, but my goal as his dad is to lead him ultimately to his savior and for him to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because at the end of the day, that's what will change his life forever. Right, buddy? And man, I want you to understand that his story can be your story. His story for some of you is your story. That God loved you enough to pursue you and to adopt you into his family. And maybe you're not there yet, but today you wanna cross that line where you say, man, I wanna be a part of the family of God. And man, I, I would just be a fool if I didn't give you an, a, ch a chance to respond to four weeks of the gospel. And so if you're here this morning and you wanna be part of the family of God, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do that right now. So at all of our campuses, whether you're watching online, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you wanna make that decision today, it, it, it's as simple as saying this, God, I'm a sinner who's rejected you. And God, I, I, I pray right now that you'd forgive me you forgive me of my sin and I believe that you came and you died for me and that you rose again so I could have victory over my sin. And so God, I submit to you. I want you to be the forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life. I want right now today for you to adopt me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I believe with my whole heart that God will honor it and you just became a member of the family of God. You've been adopted, and so adoption is your story. And that's something we celebrate around at Northridge Church. We celebrate the gospel, it's why we're here. It's, it's why we live differently, it's why we live Pi Square, it's why we tell the world about Jesus. And so as we wind down this series on the gospel, at all of our locations, at your home, in your car kind of, whether you're watching online or you're watching at one of our campuses, we're gonna stand and we're gonna rejoice and we're gonna celebrate and we're gonna sing about the gospel because the symbol of the gospel is an empty tomb because it re represents that we were once dead, but the symbol of the grave for the gospel is dead things come alive. And God has taken us from slavery and bondage and we were dead and he's made us alive and we're gonna celebrate that as a church. So let's sing this out together.